Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 20 Live today. It's Saturday, June the 1st, 2013. Our topic today is Adobe Captivate, and our special guest is our own Tammy Moore, who you're quite familiar with, who's providing us closed captioning most times. So today, she's going to multitask, but she's not going to be able to provide closed captioning to us. A shout out into the chat saying thank you to Lori Moffat, who is also helping moderate today. I want to start a little bit differently because uh, Tammy's going to be taking over the poll question, so I thought I'd take this time just to give you some background on Tammy and do a formal introduction before she takes over after I do some uh, explanation. So if you haven't really had a chance to meet Tammy, she is particularly important because she spearheaded the development and growth of an online course cooperative that has the purpose of getting professional grade tools for e-learning out to people that want to offer a free line online course for homeschool students. Her project uses Moodle as a learning management system and collaborate for their live online classrooms. And there's not a lot of turnkey curriculum specifically for online courses, excuse me, and the budget is tight for a donation-based volunteer-run project. So tools for building e-learning resources have been part of the project from the beginning. Tammy will be sharing one of her favorite tools, Adobe Captivate, with us today that we can put to use in our own classrooms, whether we have one computer or one-to-one -one iPad classroom. So I know, Tammy, you'll have an opportunity in a minute to uh, share more about yourself if you'd like to do that. And uh, we send our um, very much appreciation to a really excellent presentation that's just about to take place. So before we turn the microphone over to uh, Tammy, there's a couple of things I want to make you aware of. If you're new today or new to the recording, we do have the use of LiveBinder, uh, our Class 20 Live. We do a aggregation of all the resources that are shared on the session today. And we have a new setup here on the left-hand side. You'll see the menu. So today, our um, LiveBinder link is the Adobe Captivate with Tammy and see a list of all her resources shared underneath it. As well as our live binder, I'd like to let you know that we do a tremendous job in, in recording things for you. I know someone in the chat asked if you can see this recorded. Pass it on to your friends that we have a website, live.class20.com, specifically the archives and resources page. You were going to find um, a complete compilation of what's happening today. The full Blackboard Collaborate recording, uh, MP3 file, an embedded video file the chat log, and again, all the links to the resources that are being shared today. And one thing I didn't point out, if you are sharing any links that are complement today's uh, session, we do collect those links and put them into the live binder. So if you see that chat blank going by very quickly and you miss a link, um, you can go to the recording, go to uh, the, the archives and resources page and pick that up, as well as uh, as I said, we'll gather any links that you might have shared during the session. So I pointed out to a few of you a few minutes ago about using your laser pointers. So this is the opportunity to please get your little pointers going and click on the laser pointer, your second option down on the, on the whiteboard tools on the left-hand side of your screen, and let us know where you are located in the world. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario, in Canada. And I know everyone else is telling us where we, I know. Yes, Shambles is in Thailand. It's being different again today. And I know we said someone from Argentina. Phoenix for Peggy, San Antonio, Texas for Kim. Terrific. Thank you very much. Gives you kind of a, a wake up call, and again, it's nice to see where people are located throughout the world. So, something a little bit new. Uh, Tammy is now going to take over the mic with, again, our appreciation for the work that she's done today. And she's going to be taking care of everything from here on in. So, welcome, Tammy. Thank you very much for being with us in a different capacity today. And I know we're looking forward to having your expertise shared. So, thanks. The microphone's yours. There you go. Well, I thought it'd be fun to let the other moderators get a break today. Since I, I teach in this exact same environment about 10 hours a day, four days a week, and have done so, oh, I guess about five, six years. So I figured, hey, they get a chance to sit back because I know how to run everything in here. 
So just like we usually do in the show, the first thing we're going to start off are some poll questions. It helps me get a little bit of background to know what everyone, what their experiences are in the background. So the first poll question, how frequently do you look for resources to be used on the iPad or computer, but you just can't find anything that fits your lesson or activity needs it just right? So go ahead and place your vote. A is 0 to 30 percent, B 31 to 60, 61 to 90, more than 91 percent, or doesn't apply to you. Perhaps you're not teaching in a classroom environment with students right now. So go ahead and I'm going to give you a little bit of time to vote, and then I'm going to post it to the whiteboard. Okay, giving everyone a little bit more time. If you can't figure out how to use the polling tools, it's available just above where everyone's names are. You'll see a letter A at the moment, and you'll see a bunch of different options. Just vote A through E, whichever one seems to fit the most. And if you still can't figure it out, that's okay. Type it on into the text chat. That'll work out okay, too. Okay, it looks like everyone's probably had about enough time to vote. So I'm going to go ahead and publish it to the whiteboard. Let's go ahead and see what the results are. We go ahead and scoot this up so we could see. Okay, so it looks like for 26%, you, don't, you are able to find most everything you need. And for the second one, a little bit more, a few of you, though, are in that category where you're going, okay, I can't quite find just the right lesson thing that I need for the kids to be able to practice. Okay, let's go on to the next polling question. And this one's going to be yes or no, so give me just a second. And I'm going to switch the polling type over to yes, no type polling. The green check is a yes, and the red X is a no. So if you or your students could create your own lesson presentations, screen recordings, games, self-scoring quizzes, would you set aside the time to create them? Yes or no? So green check, yes. Red X, no. And if you can't figure out how to do the polling question, just go ahead and type it on in. Let us know if you would set aside time if you could. All right, a little bit more time, and then I'll post the results to the whiteboards. So we can take a look at it. Okay, I think everybody probably has had enough time now. Go ahead and post it. All right, let me go ahead and switch tools here. All right, so it looks like a good many, 68%. If, if students or the teacher could do it, you would do it. All right, now then, got one more question for you. Have you ever used a rapid e-learning tool such as Captivate, Lectura, or Articulate? So checking to see if anyone's actually used it before or anything similar to it. So go ahead and type in your responses in a second. I will publish it to the whiteboard. All right, and a whopping 53% have not yet done it. Oh, good, we've got at least 10% that have given it a try. Now, if you're not quite sure what rapid e-learning tools are, this is what the professionals use to build the interactives that you have. If you have any software that you've used that your school had to buy and it's all professionally done, more than likely it's either been built in Flash or it's been built in a rapid e-learning tool, and that's what Captivate is. Now, it used to be that it was too expensive for teachers to get to, but the exciting thing is now it's something that we can get to as well and get to use it. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'm going to get a start on introducing you to the tool itself. So we're going to go forward a little bit. Oh, yes, and then the newbie question. And that's for me to get to answer. And that's more or less the can you do it. So can teachers and students make their own interactive activities for learning with Captivate? And I'm living proof of it because for, especially this last year, I've really dug in and started building everything from just little interactive games for even the younger kids that I teach. I teach six different subjects, <laughs> so more than likely, I probably at least dire indirectly or directly have had a chance to teach the same subject that you have. Um, so this year, six subjects and 40 hours in, in classroom time. And so getting a chance to give them something interactive that they can do also for our asynchronous students that never actually meet live with me, but they want to be able to do something more than just sit back and watch a video. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so just a little history. I thought it would be a good place to start. Whenever I first got involved with teaching online, it was about oh, six or so years ago, give or take a year, and I started getting involved with a group called Virtual Homeschool Group. And what Virtual Homeschool Group was is it's basically an online course co-op. 
so that people who want to offer free online courses, they'd be able to do it because the tools are a little too expensive for individuals to be able to do it. Like they used to, for instance, this online classroom environment you've got here, at the least expensive is about oh, $2,200. So if you wanted to offer a free online class in this environment, doing it by yourself, you couldn't do it. So basically what our group does is if you want to offer a free online class, you can do it. So besides the online classroom, we also have been working to try to get training and tools out to these teachers. And so that's how I got involved with it. And one of the things that I was really excited about was being able to create something interactive. And at first, the only option that I actually had to get to work with back then was just Flash. So I got the web, let's see, it was the Adobe Web Suite. Oh, about 700 and something dollars. Ouch. <laughs> but that's how determined I was that I wanted to be able to build interactive stuff that the kids could be able to do. The only problem is that was too expensive for us to get that for each of the volunteers that wanted to use it. So I thought, well, OK, out of my pocket, I can do this. I, this is important to me. But there was no way we could provide that for our volunteers. And most of our volunteers wanted to te teach free classes. They hit that same thing. If you have to buy expensive tools, how can you offer a free class? But nonetheless, I dug in. One thing that I found, though, is that the learning curve for Flash was pretty high because mostly what you have to do is write code. There's some design side to it, but mostly it's code writing. And it would take a while. Matter of fact, just to give you a little bit of an idea, here is some code from one of my drag and drop games. Now, you can imagine if you're a teacher and you don't really want to learn all of the code stuff, having to do this for a simple drag and drop game. And this one doesn't even report SCORM. It didn't have reset buttons. It's just very, very, very simple code. And you can see from the scroll bar off over here that this isn't even all of it. And so I thought, you know, these other volunteers, though they would also like to do interactive types of stuff, they're not going to want to spend the time to learn, learn the code. So then along came the e-learning suite. That was the next thing. And this started a whole movement in the professional field because instead of having a team of designers that would design the look, and then it would be handed on to a team of developers that would write the code, now you could have the designers actually do everything, except if you wanted something really special. And the developers loved it because then they didn't have to spend all their time on stuff that they felt was wasting their time, and they could really write the code for the complicated stuff. But this is what moved the whole, the whole professional realm into something different, and it's called rapid e-learning. And rapid for good reason. One, you don't need to know how to do code, and two, it's a lot faster than what you would have if you did Flash. But it was still expensive. So I, I bought this one. <laughs> ka ching ka ching ka ching So still expensive on it. So then what came online next, and everybody probably that's got mobile is aware of this one. Do you remember that Apple said, uh-uh, no go? On, on, on the iPad, no flash, no browser plugins whatsoever. And that created an entire shift in the online world for people who create interactives because flash used to be useful for everything. And the e-learning suite would output to flash format. Well, with the movement now toward HTML5 so that you could get interactive stuff on the iPad, now the e-learning suite, or Captivate, which is the key thing in it, the Captivate, they now output to HTML5 as well as Flash. So if you're on a desktop browser, it will automatically detect if, you, if, the browse, if, if your device has got Flash. And if it does, it serves Flash. If your device doesn't have Flash, it automatically serves up HTML5. So now those mobile devices are able to work with these interactives. You make it once. And then the software does all that's needed to be able to make both formats. Can you imagine if you had to learn code for both, how to make something in Flash, and then had to make it again and learn how to do it in HTML5? E. <laughs> no fun there. So it's nice to have one device that does it all. But the one problem that we still had was, OK, well, it was still kind of expensive, because buying the box copy, you had a big upfront cost. And while I wanted to provide Captivate for our volunteers, 
especially since our volunteers might volunteer for just a year, we couldn't buy box copies for a volunteer that was only going to teach for a year, and then they might go on do something entirely different. So I still couldn't get Captivate for our volunteers. Then Adobe did something surprising last year. They started shifting over to a subscription model. And they started, they, the nice thing about the subscription model is you don't have that big upfront expense, and you can just purchase it month by month. And that allows teachers who, in the summertime, when you've got a ton of time to just get to enjoy building stuff, you can, you can in, in a sense, rent it during the summer. But in the school year, when you're just plain too busy to be able to build anything, you can just simply stop your subscription. And then, then next summer, you can pick it back up again. So this has moved it down into something that we can actually do for our volunteers. And we tested it out just this last year in our project. And we got the subscription for three of our volunteers as just a trial run with it. It was a great success. So this year, we're actually going to provide it for all of our volunteers that are actually developing material for their courses during the time they're actually building. So it's moved it down into something that, one, teachers could even do on their own. And two, even smaller school districts could do like we've done, because we're just a donation-based program. So we don't have a lot of money either. We're, we're maybe more cash strapped than your average small school district. So I think you'll find that it's pretty good. And if you really, really find that you like to captivate, you might even eventually discover, hey, that whole Creative Cloud suite is awesome too. I've got that too. <laughs> I, like, I like all the tools that's in the Creative Cloud. Okay, so now that you've gotten a little background, let me also give just a tad bit of history to Captivate itself. When it was brought in the e-learning suite, it started off as a little program called RoboDemo. And it was an entirely different company that designed it and built it. And Adobe got interested in it and bought it because obviously with it, its primary focus being software, it would have been great for them to have something so that they would be able to do tutorials use it to build tutorials for their software and help people learn how to use it. And so that's when they bought it. And of course, they have really, really massively improved it since then. So it seemed like a good place to start to introduce you to one of the many things it can do, and that's to do software tutorials. So for those of you that have a mobile device handy, you can actually, if you're on a desktop but you've got your mobile device, if you've got a QR code reader, you can actually just point to that QR code and you can actually run it separate from being in here on the desktop. And for those of you, don't start it quite yet though because you're going to have talking from the software. Um, I want to introduce you to a couple of things first. And I'm going to post a link to it in just a second. All right, now one of the cool things about software tutorials is that it's designed so you could do different things. Notice on the software tutorial that I'm going to show you first, and this is one that Captivate has built, made available so you can download it and dissect it and figure out how they built it. So I've got it so that you'll be able to play it and give it a try too. So it has a show me mode, and that's a sit back and watch mode, just like you would have if it were a video. It has a little progress bar. It even shows how they do as far as making their way through that one. Then it also has a try it mode. And this is one of the cool things that RoboDemo had come up with, is that it actually could have it to where it knows what the students are doing. You can actually interact with the software without even having to have that software on your computer. So this one's for Photoshop Essentials. You'll be able to actually run this little training without even having Photoshop Essentials on your device. So the Try It mode, what it does is it's like a tutor sitting right there with the students. And that the, the students actually click in the software so if in the, the show me mode, it said you do this first, you do this second, you do this third. In the try it mode, they would actually get a chance to click, and it would respond as if they're in the real software. And in the try it mode, it automatically will detect what they're doing and jump in with hints if they're not figuring it out and just giving them the nudge in the right way. Now, for those of us that teach software types of things, that's great because it frees you up as a teacher, and you can let the computer do all the tutorial. Now, if that weren't enough, it also has a test me mode. And in the test me no mode, all of those little hints go away. And they, they get an assessment to see if they know it, how to do it. Now, the nice thing about the Captivate is it's SCORM compliant. And what SCORM means, and it's actually all kinds of different things. They also have AICC and all the other different types of test taking that can communicate with an LMS. 
And what happens with that one is it actually can report to your LMS if you happen to be in a school that has one, such as Moodle, Blackboard. Uh, a lot of schools have got LMSs that they run. It will actually report to the gradebook and automatically it will update their grades. You don't have to touch a thing. So once you build it, the students can run it entirely on their own with tons of help just when they need it and also the ability to assess them and it automatically does all the grading for you. I like that feature. <laughs> no having to get in there and go through a bunch of papers. All right, now, uh, let me go ahead now and let you give it this one a try. Now, we can't take a ton of time here, but I do want you to at least get a little taste of it. And so let's take about ooh, two to four minutes or so. Let me get this link for you. Okay, and for those of you that didn't get a chance to just take a QR code reading of it, here's your version of it. And what you, I want you to do is when you feel like you've had enough typing done, or I'll just call time and we'll move on. Okay, I'm going to pull everybody back in. Just gives everyone a chance to get a little taste of it. Now, that same link is still going to be active after the show, so you'll get a chance to go back and actually explore it more fully. So I'll give everyone a chance to go ahead and shut that one down so you don't have two voices at the same time. Go ahead and let you come back in. Now, let me just check to make sure everyone was okay and successful. I know if you're logged in here to the live classroom on a mobile device, a lot of times when you switch over to run another so the, the browser, sometimes it's a little harder to do two at the same time. Feel free to switch it out, log back in on a desktop version, and then you can free up your mobile device with the QR codes to be able to try it just on mobile but without trying to do the classroom and this at the same time. Okay, so let's just see how everyone's doing as far as getting it to play. So notice that you might notice that you get a little message saying that your browser might not support some of the features. That's okay. That's a browser compliant. They're all coming up really, really fast as HTML5 gets the standards in place. And so usually if you just go ahead and click OK, it still plays everything perfectly. There you go. There's plenty of examples. I'm surprised Firefox wouldn't, though, because Firefox is one that, that I use, and it does fine. There you go. It could be. You might need to update Flash a little bit on it. Now, if you're in an iPad classroom, of course, you'll get a chance to have all of them ready to go before you use them in your classes. Or if you've got desktops, you've got time to make sure they're all ready to go. All right, so there we go. Now, how many of you are in uh, a, an environment with one-to-one -one iPads? Just kind of curious how many of them. I thought possibly about even putting that in here as one of the questions, but I figured I could just ask it live time in the class. Any, how many of you are, just go ahead and type in me if you're one-to-one. -one. There you go. Well, even if you've only got a few, one thing about it is because it can output to Swift, you could even use smart boards if you don't have as many iPads to go around. My son has he's all grown up. He's 24, and he works in a school district in the tech department. And they've really been lucky. They've gone one to one. There you go. So the netbooks, it'll be able to play Flash. It'll play the Flash version. There you go. So the nice thing about this is because it auto detects. You make it one time, it'll auto detect. If it's a device like a laptop or a desktop or a netbook, um, and I think even the Android can run Flash, if I remember correctly. It'll run the Flash version. 
If it's a mobile device that doesn't have Flash, then it automatically feed the HTML5 version. Now, there are some, some compliance things that are still coming in place for the different browsers. Some browsers have got 100% perfect compliance with all the standards for HTML5 that are being rapidly developed right now. Some of them are a little bit behind. So if you ever have any trouble, just try a different browser, because a lot of times it's just a matter of the browsers playing catch up a little bit. But they're doing pretty well. All right, so now the reason for introducing this as a software tutorial is because that's how Robo Demo started off, just doing software. But Adobe has moved it far beyond just doing software. It also can do regular lessons. Oh, for instance, one of the classes that I do some development for is our advanced biology. And that is a really tremendously information dense type of course. Now, here's Actually, here's one that I've actually created as far as just a screenshot from it. And I want to point out some of the features that you can have turned on. So one of the things you can have turned on is closed captioning. Now, of course, you have to type it in. But if you need to have students that are, are hearing impaired, or if you, even if you don't have students that are hearing impaired, but you're in a district that's really big on complying with some of the laws related to making sure that everything that you've got is compliant for those people who can't hear, then you can type in your closed caption. And usually, when you're building these, you're going to have your script. You just simply copy paste in your scripts one line at a time. At the same time, I always do closed captioning just in case we have future students that might need the closed captioning. I'm the closed captionist in here each week, so obviously, closed captioning is on my radar. Another nice thing too is that's going to help students who are English as second languages, because whenever you type it in, it can help them. Because a lot of times, you will have students that will will need that extra exposure to the written language, or they might actually find it a little easier when it's written out. Mm -hmm. And it has also is JAWS compliant. So if you have students that are blind, it also has that. So you can work it out so that, it's, so that your students who are blind are able to use it. You have to remember, this is a professional level tool. And especially in government, a lot of those are really, really, they're very, very specific. We have to have it to where all, everyone can have. Mm -hmm. And another advantage to doing the closed captioning is that it will work with the search tool. Whenever you turn on the, the table of contents, you don't have to have the table of contents on, but whenever you use it, the search feature, they can type in the word. It will actually look through the closed captioning, and then it will get rid of all slides that don't have that pop up. And it will then limit it to just the slides that have it on there. So this can be a great study tool for students if they suddenly realize, oh, what? What was a core puzzle? I can't remember. Well, then, as long as they know how to spell it, they can type it in and have it search for it. I'll bring up any slide that has that in the closed captioning. So this is a great tool for students. Students also can bookmark. You see a little bookmark symbol? It, let's say they're, they're going through and they're learning the material, and they, they can tell one particular page has got a ton of detail they'll want to come back to. Well, they can just click the little bookmark tool and then put a little bookmark symbol back there so that they can easily remember to come back. Another nice thing is that it checks off what they've seen. So if they suddenly decide they want to skip ahead, then it will show that they skipped that slide because it won't have a check mark there. And then they can come back to it a little bit later. So between the bookmarking and the, the checkbook, you can. It also has a way to collapse your, the different topics. Like for instance, you see that little triangle right there? That is showing that there are actually hidden slides under that subgroup. They can click on the triangle, and it could be like this one, where the subgroup is opened up, so that you can keep your table of contents nice and clean. Mm -hmm. And you can actually, you can, there's a variety of different ways that you can even put in progress, progress bars and all kinds of things that's inside of it. And they can easily, if you do put the table of contents in, they can easily jump around as they need to, which is great, especially when they're doing study time. Anything that they know really well, they can skip over. Mm -hmm. And it has all kinds of tools here. You've got their, they have the ability to go backwards, forwards. They can refresh it, start from the beginning. They can mute it. They can close it. There's the closed captioning button, so they can turn the closed captioning off and on. Like I said, this is a professional grade tool. This is what the pros use that do this as their full, they're not, they're not teachers, but they're full-time course developers. Now, another really cool thing, and that's what's on this next slide, but I'll probably come back to this one, is that if they start off on their desktop version, even if they're doing the Swift version on the desktop, 
and they, they let's say mom comes in and says, okay, we've got a dentist appointment. Grab up, grab up your iPad. You'll have to finish your lesson while we're waiting for the appointment for, to get called in. Well, what's really cool is when they pick it up on their iPad, they'll come in and they'll, they'll give them a little, little window and they'll ask, do you want to start over? Do you want to pick up from where you left off? And if they say, pick up from where I left off, as of the exact wording, but that's essentially what it is, it will actually show what they've, show the check marks on the things that they've already done. And it will start them up right off the bat on the place where they left off. And it'll work vice versa, too. So if you start off on your iPad and then pick it up going into the learner management system and you pick it up on your desktop, it does the same thing. And even, even if they just have a mobile device or they just have a desktop, it will remember where they left off. So the next time they come in, it might be weeks later, as long as they're coming in on that same device or if it's a mobile device and it's connected up to their desktop then it knows that they've already done a little bit of it, and it gives them an the option to pick up where they left off. So very, very, very powerful tools there. OK, now let me go ahead and jump on forward a little bit. OK, some other output formats that they have is if you don't have any interactivity, then what you could do if it's just a sit back and watch, or if you have interactivity and you just want to pull your interactive elements separate, and then have a YouTube video, it has a one button uh, upload to YouTube once you connect it up to your account. So for instance, this one that's back over here that I did, the one for the immune system, at, once I got done, it had a couple of interactives in it. In the version I wanted to upload to YouTube, I just took the interactives out, published it to YouTube, and then there's the video version. The nice thing about that is it streams. It doesn't put any extra strain on our server because it's coming off of YouTube. And then they can just do these interactives like this kidney drag and drop. And they can pick these up and put them down. We can put those separate if we want to. So you always have the option to blend things if you want to. So if you're in a school where your server admin says, oh, OK, uh, you might like some video types of things, but no, 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 no. That's too much of a strain on our server. Well, no problem. If you can get the YouTube access, or just simply you can output it just to MP4. It doesn't even have to go to YouTube. One of the formats you can import out to is MP4. And just put that directly on your computers. Don't even have to, to drag anything through the net. You can just have it right there on, on, your, um, uh, on your systems for your students to be able to play. And so you can have it either way, with interactivity embedded in or with interactivity separate. So you can do an MP4 video for those elements that are not interactive. OK, now, next thing that we're going to talk about is this is the branching view. And it shows how you can really customize things. Oh, for instance, you might have everybody, everybody starts out on the same screen. But let's say on this screen right here, and I know it's really tiny, but on this screen, you give students the option of either doing this, this, or this. Well, they can take those options. And notice how everything can branch off of it. So you can create everything from, oh, for instance, those, you know those stories that you can choose your own ending kinds of things? You can create, have your students create stories where the, it's very interactive. The, at the, the reader gets to select what they want to do at the next point. They could branch out. So that's a use of this that you could do with your students. So if you get one computer in your classroom with Captivate, you can set even just that one computer up so students could build things on it. Um, it uh, can also work for if you just wanted to have it to where students can choose different activities. And then they can get instructions on how to use the tools for that activity or put that. See, it's really easy to individualize and let the, let the students pick what it is that they want to do as they go through it. And they don't have to see all the slides for the things that they don't want to do. They just simply see the parts for what they do want to do. Now, there's another advantage to the ability to be able to branch, and this is brand new in the most recent version, in that now you can pretest students at the beginning. So when they first fire up something, they can answer some questions. And based on the score they get in the pretest, they can be sent to the basic branch, the average branch, or the advanced branch. So you can meet the needs of each of your students once you've got it built. So those that need remediation, you could send them to getting those basics that they need to have that they just don't have yet to be able to do the work that the average student could do. And you can still take those advanced students and take them way beyond what you would do otherwise. 
And each of these can have remediation. So, so say pretest said average, but once they started working in there, they started they, they seem to have some trouble. You can set it up with remediation that will help them out as they're working through it. And at the very end, you can use SCORM as one of the output formats. And what that will do is that will report scores out. So if you have an LMS especially, it's nice. We, I, we, we have an LMS for what we do. And you don't have to touch the grading. You can let the computer do all the scoring. So that's what's really, really nice. Oh, no, no, that's what I'm going to tell you about at the, at the end, the subscription model. That's if you buy it. And actually, uh, kept, uh, Adobe is leaving the box model version of it. And they're going to subscription. And that's why now I feel like I can tell other people about it, because you don't have to pay the big money for the, for the, the box copy. So hang in there. You'll find it's quite affordable. OK, now, another nice thing that Adobe has done is, is education is now very much on the radar for Adobe. And they've created something called the Adobe Education Exchange. And oh, it is nice. It is flashy. The nice thing about the Adobe Education Exchange is that this is where we can come in as educators. And what we build, we can share with other people. So I'm going to go ahead and post the link to the exchange. But I'm also going to post the link to the exchange that's my page there. And you'll find that I have got all kinds of my Adobe projects there. You can download it. And then with your Captivate, open it up and modify it, change it to whatever way you want, use it as much as you need, um, and you take bits and pieces of it that you like and add to it. Now, my particular page there, if you want to see what my stuff is, is right there. I also do a lot of illustrations, so a lot of my illustration work is there too. So especially if you're a chemistry teacher, you'll probably find a lot of the stuff that I've got there useful. I've got Oh, beakers and flasks and stuff like that, where it actually has some transparency so you can see in behind it. So it looks, seems like there's really glass. So you can make some interactives where the students can actually do labs. So there's another good use. If you are a science teacher, you can set up lab simulations where the students actually will, will just like what you've seen on the internet with interactive uh, lab simulators, you can create that too, where you can create the, the labs. Uh, one of my big projects this summer is to do virtual dissections for my biology students. So, because we've got a lot of families, they go, uh, we're a little squeamish about dissecting the frog and the worm. And is there any, are there any other options? <laughs> so I'm going to build a, an, a, a simulation of dissections. So they'll go in and use the tools. They'll learn all sorts of things. And you can build that with Captivate. OK, so I want to let you know that the exchange is there. It's got all kinds of resources. All you have to do to find stuff specific to Captivate is click on where it says Resources. And I think I actually have a little pull out here. Let me go ahead and do that. All right, I'm going to just position this. You can see a simulation of what it would be like on the web page. So you can click, click on Resources. And then you can do the little the All Products. And you can select Captivate. And then you can see everything that's been shared by other instructors for Captivate specifically. And download it. And then you've got the files that you can go in and modify and change. And they have all kinds of other software. You can also sort it by resources on different subjects that you want to do or different grade levels that you want to do. So it has a really nice sorting feature in it. There you go. And I think you have to probably sign up, but it's free in order to, in order to I know in order to add something, you have to sign up might have to also sign up in order to download something. I'm not quite sure on that one. But definitely worthwhile, and it's a really, really nice site. They just really updated it and made it this good, uh, I guess it was about six weeks ago. Before that, it was just more like a typical forum. But they, they really realized that education is, is a market that's worth serving. And so they've really done it up nice. OK, now, they also have a Captivate blog that you can go to. It has a ton of different articles, and there's free training. Uh, I think in this next month, I think every week has got at least one, if not more than one, free training webinars. So one thing that I definitely can say about Adobe is they don't leave you hanging trying to figure out how to use it. They, they have continuous free webinars for you to go to. And you can go in and, and see how to do it. And they cover everything from first time, this is the first time you're going to make something, all the way up to the really advanced users that are using advanced actions, where you can actually do some programming in with it so that you can have it uh, if, if else types of statements and things that's in the background. 
Okay, now let me get you some links here related to the Captivate blog. Here's the Captivate blog link for their homepage. Oh, I see Peggy's got it already. They also have a specific uh, tutorials page. Let me go ahead and get that one up there too. Okay, one of the pages on the blog site, that's for their tutorials, and they try to group them all together there. And they also have uh, example projects, and that's where you'll find a lot of them that you're going to see from me today, including that one that uh, I showed you just a little bit ago with the Photoshop elements training. All right, so several different resources. They don't leave you hanging. They don't leave you alone. You've got all kinds of places you can go to. They've got a Facebook group page. They've got forums at Adobe. If you get stuck with something, usually you can get an answer right away. If it's a technical thing, I found that if you go to the Adobe forums for Captivate, you usually can get an answer within an hour. So you've got a ton of support both from the community of other users as well as from the Captivate team itself. And so you're not going to be left struggling trying to figure it out. Okay, and seminars for the next month or so. Let me go ahead and put that one up here. If you're wondering, okay, well, this would be my time to get to try it out. And they do have a one month free trial too, by the way. Um, this month, if you want to see what free webinar training they've got, that link will take you directly to the ones that are running in this near period of time, probably June, July time range. So you're really going to find that it's a very useful place. You'll probably see me at some of those webinars. I try to attend as many of them as I can around my teaching schedule. Okay, now I'm going to let you try another one out. This is one that they came out, that they, they released. Uh, so that you can download it and pick it apart and see how the professionals build stuff. And it's called Quarantine. You're going to love it. I'm going to go ahead and give you a link to it so that you can play it a little bit. There'll be another one where you probably won't have time to play it all the way through, but you can have enough time right now to get a taste of it and you can come back to it later. So here is the link for that one. I'll get quiet, otherwise you'll have my voice and their voice. So in just a little bit, we'll pick up again. All right, I'm going to pull you out, so come on back in. Go ahead and close it down. You can continue it a little bit later. You can come back in. So hopefully you had a chance to enjoy that one. And what they do periodically is they go ahead and have the professionals build these, and then they specifically have hired them to do it for sharing with people who are building Captivate. So those of us that are newbies that are still learning all of the cool tricks and, and tips, we can go in, we can dissect it. They had a whole webinar focused around this particular one, and they answered questions about how it was designed. And so even if you looked at it and dissecting it, you felt like, uh, I can't quite figure out, how did they do that? I've got a question about that one. That's OK. If you can't open it, it's probably browser related. Try a different browser. And whenever I create, it, create mine, and I think also for them, they've been targeting primarily tablets. But you can, when you build it, if in your classroom you prefer to have your students using iPhones, you just build your lesson set to the scale and size for it, and then target for that one. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody had asked about the Creative Commons at the exchange. Sorry, I missed that question. Shambles Guru had a great question. Yeah, each person that shares it, they can set their own license, but the whole purpose of the exchange is to share. So pretty much everybody that's there, they come in and they post stuff with the idea of sharing. I set all mine to uh, Creative Commons. All you have to do is just say it's by me, and you can use my stuff. And you can, you're free to change it up. Um, I think I do have on most of them that, that uh, don't want you to make money off of it. That, that's one of the options you could do with Creative Commons. I, I don't mind sharing, but if somebody else is, is running their business off of what I make, I, it feels a little different there. But most everybody that's there, if they're going to post it, they post it with the idea for people to be able to use in their classrooms or to take the basic file and modify it to make it to what they want it to be. Okay, now you've had a chance to get to explore them. One of the things I really like about quarantine is the opening. It felt so much like a movie because of the way the sky scrolls up. And all they do on that one to make that scroll effect is they've just got a really large image 
And then one of the things you can do in Captivate are, are motion effects. And they just simply have, they simply have that image with the motion effect that is just moving up. And it makes it seem like you're looking up, looking down. So it has some really cool mo motion effects that are in it as well. Okay, now the next thing I want to mention is that if you feel like you, you have to go out on the internet to find all these resources, you you don't. One of the new things that they've got in the new version is that after you've had your program open for a little bit, and you could turn this off if you find it to be annoying, but they give you a little time to go ahead and get started and get rolling with your project. And if you want it, you can have it to where this little announcement comes up. It usually comes in about five minutes after you've been working. The little announcement will come up and it will tell you about training opportunities. It will tell you just any kind of important thing that they feel like you would want to know as a user of Captivate. So they'll put webinar announcements in there. When you do the see more, it'll take you then to the web page where it will allow you to sign up for it or get a little bit more information for it. And I find that this is really, really nice because I find that I do get a chance to take more, uh, more training opportunities because it, these things pop up. And I could take a look and know that they're there instead of having to go and hunt it down at the blog, which is not that hard. You know, you just check it at the blog every now and then. But it's nice to have this inside. Yeah, see, Lori uses it, uses Captivate. And so that's, she's also found the same thing. You get some nice alerts that's there. And you can also, you can also, if you want to share it with other people, really easy to share it out to your Facebook or Twitter or go make comments on it. It's got all kinds of extra tools in there that you might want to do. And you can filter based on what you want to see information about. Yeah, it is. It's like, it's like having it on speed dial. All right. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is there's a sums of 10 game. I think the first thing I'll do is just have you try it so you know what it is. And I'm actually going to show you how easy it is to make it. Okay, so let me get this one. Now, this was a test run. When my kids were little and I wanted to help them learn sums of 10, we actually, on cardstock and with markers, made a little game. It was with triangles for that, but in this one, I've got squares. And the kids would match colors and they would match the two numbers that would add them up to 10. Well, this year I was teaching fifth grade math and I thought, you know, it'd be great to have an interactive that uses that same idea for a game. So this was my test run for just making sure it worked. So you get a chance to see what it looks like too. So let me get you the specific link to it. And it's a game that you can interact with. You'll be able to use your iPad and actually move stuff around. Or if you're coming in on the desktop, just use your mouse. So I'll give you a chance to try that a little bit. There's no voice in this one, but I will go off the mic just so you've got a little more bandwidth. Okay, you might not have finished all the way, but I'm going to go ahead and pull you back in. I just wanted you to just get an idea of what it's like. I've, I found I really enjoy doing these types of drag and drop activities on the iPad. It's fun even on the desktop where you're using the mouse, but getting to actually take your finger and move the little pieces around, oh, I just love the way that feels. <laughs> yeah, it's a little more challenging because, and I've got a triangle, triangle shaped version of it and then the square version. I, this was a test of the square version in this particular example that you see, and I wanted to make sure the square version worked on all the different devices and was doing okay. The square version has the advantage of instead of just three matches, three possibilities, they have four possibilities that they have to work with. Plus, it was a little bit easier on the drag and drop to design it when it was a square compared to when it was a triangle because of the shapes tending to be squares anyway for your objects that you drag. Now, for what I'm going to do is I am going to do app share and I'm going to show you how easy it is to actually build this with the Captivate. Now, remember that page I showed you a little bit ago on the history page and I was telling you how when I was learning in Flash and I showed you all the code, to build something like this would probably take in about three to four screens worth of typing in code because it also has the undo and the reset and it can submit to SCORM. So this, you're talking about a pretty complicated thing to have to code up if you were using Flash. But with Captivate, let me show you how easy it is. Go ahead, switch over to AppShare. Okay, so AppShare is rolling. Now, I've just got a blank project. It's about, six, it's about uh, 600 by 800 pixels. And you can see it's just white. Now, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to worry about putting a background image like we've got in that one with the wood in the background. But you can probably see how it would be really easy to go on the Internet, find a Creative Commons image of a wood desktop, and just put it in the background. 
Now, for a second, you're going to see something come over the top, and that's just simply going to be my finder so I can bring in the images. So let me go ahead and I'm going to select them. There's about oh, 10 or so of them. I'm just dragging and dropping them all in at the same time. And then let me go ahead and minimize that so you can see it. Now you can see all my cards are in. Go ahead and maybe I'll just do one at a time. There's all the cards that are in the game. These I created in Adobe Illustrator, but you can probably create, a, create them in about any, any kind of a graphics program. You could even set your kids to work to, to make the cards. You could do it with probably with GIMP or just about anything that will let you, let you make it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to spread these out a little bit so I can see them. Now, when I designed my cards, just to, um, for my test, I wanted to make sure, oops, I did, <laughs> did get one here that I scrunched up. All right, now let me see what size these are, and I'll actually fix my size. So let me go down. All right, you can actually control the size. So it's supposed to be one, let's see, 84 by 84. So let me fix this so that I've got an 84 by 84. I'm going to type in 84. And then I'm going to get rid of the constraint things just in case I need it, 84. And then I'm going to put constraint back on. OK, now we've got that. Sorry about that. Made a little, a little size change there. OK, so what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to just test. And well, it's already been tested because I know all the cards work. I'm going to, let's see, I'm just going to go ahead and set them up a little bit so that I've got matches. And let's see, the 9 and 1, that goes together. All right, and the, see, a 4 on the top goes there. Let me slide it over a little bit. OK, and see, I need 6 on the bottom. OK, that must be one of the top cards then. So one with the 9 on the top. So I could actually play the game while I'm making this, don't I? <laughs> OK, and then we should have one with a 9 on the side. More than likely, that fits there. 2, 5, and 10. That one goes here. And you can see I took care whenever I designed my cards, just so that it'd be a little bit easier for the students. They'd only have one possible match. But you could always increase the challenge with a drag and drop. You can even have these where several different possible cards can be put in. And it will still accept it. OK, 8 and 2. And let's see, six, four, nine, one. Now, whenever you're actually building this yourself, you can be more fiddly about the exact placements for where these are going to be dropped. OK, here we go. I've got them all. I'm going to select these, move them all up here. OK, now I'm not going to be super fiddly. This basically is going to form up the solution. Now, what I'm going to do is these two right here, I'm going to let those be the base cards. Or I could maybe just do one being a base card. I think I might do that. See this one that's highlighted that tells me which one I selected. And I'm going to lock that one. Oops, did I pick the wrong one? I guess I did. Sorry. Let me try that again. I unlock the one that I got there. All right, we'll choose this one. There we go. You can see that little lock symbol shows that that one's locked down. All right, this is basically going to form up my solution. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select them all. I'm going to go up to, I don't know if you could see edit and copy or not, but I'm going up to an edit bar. It's a, a thing with the app share. I'm not sure if you can see them or not. But I'm going to do copy. And then I'm going to do paste. And what I'm, going to do, what I'm doing is I'm getting a copy of all of those things that I didn't lock down. These are going to be my drag objects. These are my answer places. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to start the drag and drop. And again, you, with AppShare, you might not see the little drop down. And that one's going to be insert. And I'm going to do launch drag and drop wizard. OK, hopefully you can see the wizard. That's one thing I didn't think about until just now as far as as far as whether you can see it or not. Oh, good, good. OK, now, this is the drag and drop wizard. And this is going to show you how easy it is. We've got all of our little, all of our pieces in place. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of the objects that are going to get dragged. And look how easy it is. Just select them here. And then all of these are drag objects. And then I'm going to click Next. OK, and then once we get to the next, I'm going to be selecting all of the objects that are going to be the target objects. So now I'm going to select target objects here. And then I'm going to hit Next. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to match them up. 
So this one right here, there's, good, there's a little symbol in the middle. It's like a plus symbol. And I'm just simply going to point it to where the answer is. All right, and that goes to this one. And then when I do this one, it goes to that one. This one's going to go to this one. Let me move this little message out of the way. All right, and then this one goes to this one. That one goes to that one. This one goes to that one. And this one goes to that one. I'm almost done. And then this one goes to here. This one goes to here. Click on this one. Take that little plus and point it to here. OK, now basically I've told Captivate what the matches will be. So now I'm finished with that part of it. OK, now what I'm going to do is you don't want the students to see the answers. So what you're going to do is you're going to set all of these that are in here. And remember, you lock that one down. But I'm going to set all these to where they're invisible. So I'm going to go up and let's see. You might have to do, oh, that's because I'm over here. OK, go to the Properties panel. And I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to set the visibility to the target objects down to 0. And voila, whenever it actually runs, they won't see the answers that are there, because those will be invisible. They're set down to 0. Now, of course, what we want to do is randomize these. So we can move them around. And that way, they don't necessarily see a particular answer order. And like I said, I'm not going to worry too much about getting them precisely exactly. And we'll even drop that one up there. OK, now you can even turn on, if we, this right here is the wizard for the drag and drop, so you can customize it even more. So we're going to go in here, and we can, oh, for instance, if you want it to where the hand cursor pops up, whenever they, they go over the top of it, you could turn that on. You can have it to where it sends, if they, don't, if they don't put it in the right spot, it sends it back to its original. I've got that turned on. And uh, let's see, uh, da, 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 da. you can have it to where they can have just one attempt, any number of attempts, or infinite. I want infinite. I want them to be able to keep on doing it over and over and over again. And the failure capture, and I think I'll turn that off. That's that blue thing. You can leave it and customize it so they don't get it right when they submit it. You can tell them maybe try again, or that's OK you know, if you want to encourage them. And you can also add undo and reset buttons. So if they put something in the wrong spot, they can do undo, or they can reset it all the way from the beginning. OK, and basically, that's it. We're done. That's all it would take. From here, you would just test it to make sure it works OK. But it'll work just like the game that we just built. And it took me, what, maybe five minutes to build it? Oh, and I see our time, too. I'm running out of time. OK, I better stop here, because uh, we're already over. All right, let me go ahead. I've got to actually take my tool away in order to stop AppShare, because Captivate's got a little issue with the controls. So let me go ahead and take this off. All right, and considering the time, I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over. I do have a few more things we could talk about, but I know some of you might have to go right away. If you want to stick around afterwards, though, I can tell you some more about it and answer some more questions. So I will turn it over to, I think Kim usually does the close. Yes, absolutely. I'll be doing that. Uh, we'll put questions in just a bit, but we want to let you know that on Tuesday, June the 3rd, Steve Hagedon will be interviewing, interviewing Dan Winkle, and on June 6th, he'll have the virtual big code session with Ben Rines, and then on June the 12th, he'll we'll be talking with Larry Ferranzo. So you want to make sure you uh, attend those sessions. And we're going to have Holly Clark join us on June 8th. And on June 15th, we will be talking about the summer of making and connecting and the National Writing Project. And we'll have Christina Cantrell, Paul O, Paul Allison, um, the NYC New York City Writing Project, and Karen Fassel which will be a very really fascinating discussion. And June the 22nd, we will not have a show uh, due to ISTE will be in San Antonio, and that's the day of the Hack Education Unconference Day. And June 29th, where we have things um, in the works, I will let you know for sure on that topic. And we want to let you know that 
uh, just a few weeks or so. Can I just like to that. jump to that one if I could? Sure. As you all know, we are very enthusiastic users of live binders. And it's that time of year where we get the opportunity to nominate a binder for the 2013 Top 10 Contest. So we want you all to know about this, because I know many of you are also live binder creators. And the nominating process is beginning right now. And all you have to do, and the link is in our live binder today, you go to that link and you fill in the nomination form. And they ask you to describe why you're nominating that binder. And then it gets added for people to vote on. So there's about a week to nominate people. And then there's a week to vote on them. The voting is going to be uh, between June 8th and June 14th. And the, they have some awesome prizes. The winners receive a top 10 10 label on their binder, and their binder gets posted on the top 10 shelf, and they receive bookmarks featuring their binder with a QR code for sharing. They also get a chance to come on a live binder show and share their live binders and how they create them later in the year. So we hope that you'll all think about nominating some of the great live binders you've seen. They can be those created by teachers, by students, anyone, and uh, go to that nomination form and, and submit them right away. Don't wait. Thank you. I thought I would jump in. Kim, I just turned your mic off for a second. We were hearing your breathing for some reason. So if you're talking, I just want to let you know that, that you'll have to click your mic button. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. There's a lot of background noise going on over here. Uh, we hope that you'll nominate um, some of the live binders that you've created and maybe some of the, that attends our show. We'll also be able to uh, win one of the prizes. And we would love for you to nominate one of our featured teacher sessions uh, for an upcoming session. Just fill out the form, put your information, and you can nominate yourself or any colleague that works with educators or students. As well as uh, when we look at today, there will be a, a survey link that opens automatically in your browser. And we'd love for you to get your feedback on today's session, as well as future topics that you'd like to see shows talking about in the future. You can also request a professional development certificate and just input your name and email address on that survey link. And anytime you watch one of the archives, from our past shows, you can also use that same survey link. And all of these links are found in our Live Binder link and on our website. And you can request a professional development for certificate for watching one of the archived sessions. We have an iTunes View channel that shows the MP3s and the MP4s of each of our shows that you can subscribe to or download individually. And we also have an RSS feed on our blog page, on our archives and resources page of our website that you can subscribe to if you wanted to use a regular RSS feed aggregator instead of using iTunes or if you wanted to use both. So both routes are for you to um, get the follow-up resources. And we want to extend a very special thank you to Tammy Moore, who is our great presenter, and one of our homegrown uh, own, and we are very appreciative of her time, as well as Steve Harkinon, who is our founder of Crafter 2.0, and Lee who provides our site for the website, and to each of you who participated in the conversation and the show and shared resources today and brought the word collaborate for allowing us to meet every week in this environment. So we're very grateful for that. So we're going to take questions. If you have questions that um, you are waiting to ask, if you'd like to take the mic, we can give you the mic, or you can continue typing them in the chat. If there's something that uh, you have something specific that wasn't already addressed, 
please let us know. Uh, Lily, did you take down something that uh, we might have missed or that wasn't already answered? I know one question probably everybody has is the cost, and I ran out of time. So I know probably everybody's going, okay, well, how much does it cost for that? How much is it? Okay, for the Adobe Captivate doing the subscription one, for one thing, you get one month free. So one month free, that means a third of your, maybe over a third of your summer vacation when you might want to give this a try, it won't cost you anything at all. And if you do it for, if you do it on a month by month plan, which would be good if you are so busy in the school year you couldn't possibly build anything, I would go for this because you can drop your subscription. So you can get June completely free and then July just pay $29.99 and if you've got any time in August, well, you can keep on going. And then you could drop it and then use it again next summer. It'll keep your costs way down. If you feel like, oh, no, this is something I am going to use all year round, then you might want to go for the one-year plan. And with that one, you just commit to continuing it for the full year, but then it's just $19.99. And no hoops to jump through proving you're a teacher when you do the Captivate subscription. Now, if you do the Creative Cloud, um, that's, that's a bigger offering that they've got with all of the other suites that they've got. That one, you have to jump through hoops to say, yes, I really am a teacher teacher, come on, give me the teacher discount, but not on this one. All you have, you just sign up for it. It's just that one price. You don't have to prove you're a teacher. You can get it for $19.99. And so in, to me, it's worth it because I really, really think getting access to a pro grade tool and being able to make the interactive stuff that I love to make. And for right now, I just feel like it'd be really useful for teachers. A lot of teachers are doing the flipped classroom. You can make some amazing stuff for your students to be able to use in the flipped classroom and then even use it during your classroom time because of the interactivity that you can build. And with the, the I've been looking into the new standards for mathematics that are coming up. And, you know, there's not a lot of curriculum out there that's already set up for that. And so, yeah, there's a lot of curriculum that say, yeah, we're ready for the new standards. Not. I looked at our curriculum that we're using, and the official word is, oh, yes, we're standards compliant. But I took a look at the fifth grade that I'm teaching this year and looking to see how compliant it's going to be for us to use it next year for families that are in compliant states. And I'm going, there is no way you can call this compliance. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to readjust it and make a lot of stuff. And with the new tasks, like the park test and the, the smarter balance test, they're computer oriented. They've got drag and drop. That's what the kids are going to be doing on the test. So you can actually build things very much like what they're going to actually experience on the park test. So things like that, just to be thinking about, it's going to be worth it. It's worth it. Uh, can two users with their own accounts collaborate on one project? Yes, and I think it's going to actually be more because one thing that they seem to be really interested in is making it to where it's more and more collaborative. The one thing that you have to remember on pro level is that they're collaborating all the time too because a lot of times you'll have someone working on illustrators at the pro level and you've got somebody who's doing the design on the thing itself and so a lot of times there's already teams working on it. So it's really easy to work with that. Now if you go, if you have, if you feel like you want to do a whole team, let's say you're in a school and you've got people who are good at the art and you want custom artwork. And you've got people that actually know how to do flash. And what you might want to do then is get the e-learning suite, which is it's going to include Captivate and do everything else. And then when people make something, the artist people do something in Photoshop, it actually can link up into the, and you bring it in just as a Photoshop file into the, and it even knows if it changes. So you can have somebody working on Photoshop uh, and uh, it has to be on the same computer though, but if you have, if you, say you have students, you have one student that's going to use Photoshop and, and do the artwork, another student's working on the Captivate. Well, when the Photoshop student actually up, updates their image, and you, then the, the Captivate student goes in to start working on the Captivate side, it actually will tell you, hey, the artwork has been updated. Do you want to update it in your Captivate or not? And you just can tell it yes. And it all by itself puts the newest version of the artwork in place inside of the Captivate if you've got the whole e-learning suite. Yeah, same with, if you're, if, same with other things that integrates with it, it. And it also has a, if you do the e-learning suite, 
And it also has some really nice sound stuff. There's sound built in. You can do recording from inside of Captivate. But if you want to go way up and above and you want your students to add sound effects, so for instance, let's say they're doing a story and they want it to sound like at one point there's a character on a telephone, has that telephone so sound. Well, if you wanted to do it up bigger than Captivate and get the whole learning suite, then your kids that are doing the sound side, then they could do the special effects that are in Adobe Audition and um, and they could get that those cool sounds added in that takes special processing to do. And then it auto updates into the into the Captivate too. So that and it gives you a little bit of an idea of, of teams working together on it. Um, the next one, so games are still available if you aren't currently paying. Oh, yeah, yeah. See, when you hit publish, it goes out to an HTML5 file and a Swift file if you tell it to do both. And you can, you can upload it to a YouTube. Now, if you do the trial, I do want to let you know on the trial version, it expires when the trial is done. But it does let you try it, see if you like it. And if you get it, then the, the trial, then you can keep the trial, that once you activate the trial, then those after that are always going to be available. They're not going to expire, unless you want to expire it. You can actually set it to expire. You can even password code your interactives if you need to. If for some reason you want only students, certain groups of students to do a particular interactive, you can actually add a password level on it. And, and then the students would have to enter that password before they would get to, to use it. So you could set up a multi-stage game, for instance, and they get the password at the end of one game level. And only if they use that password can they get in the next game level. And that will let them do games uh, that go level by level by level or activities that go level by level by level if you want to make sure nobody gets in that shouldn't be getting into it. Uh huh. You can. And one nice thing, too, about the HTML5 output is because it's HTML5, you can go in and actually hand code stuff in there, too. So if you've got students that are learning HTML5, it's a great way for them to, to get a start because they have all the HTML5 there and they can go and just play around with it and make some changes to the HTML5 side of things. Swift files are a little more self contained. You can't really, once a Swift file is published, you can't really get back into Swift file um, from the published version of it, but you've got the, the Captivate version you can still get in and change, make changes to. Yeah, so you can keep on using it. So for instance, just make sure you, that, you, that you fully feel confident. I can, stop my, I can stop my subscription right now today, and I can still use all the stuff that I made. Now just remember that the one caveat is whatever you make during the free month trial, you can't keep using that one. But if you just do one month beyond that, that's all it takes. You get one month's worth of actually paying for it. It's out of trial. Then you can open them up and then republish them, and those are forever. You can, as long as, as long as HTML5 is around and as long as Swift's around, you've got it. I mean, sure there's an two people to be logged on at the same time. Uh, not sure if I heard you about being on at the same time. Is that what you said? In the, the Captivate or in the... If they can be logged on to the same account at the same time. Okay. Um, that, I'm not 100% sure. I would imagine that if you've got one computer you set up, you want your kids to be able to do it with activities, you probably could. And I do know that they will let you have it on, for instance, if, you, if you're as a teacher, you can have it on, I'm trying to think how many that they had. Uh, it was at least two computers that you could have it on with that one. Let me make sure. Oh, and one thing I wanted to do before before people started going too far is I want to let you know that um, the there's a whole bunch of examples inside of a file. I originally set this up so that I could invite our families in to help us with beta testing, but, but I just basically added some stuff on for everyone here today. But it'll stay. There'll be beta tests. You'll see brand new stuff throughout the year going in that I'm beta testing. And if you want to just, you can keep coming back to this and see all kinds of new stuff going in. And after stuff gets out of beta test, it might drop off, um, but new stuff will come in. And I'm going to give you the link to that. If you bookmark it, you can keep coming back and seeing the examples that we're building for our project. Here it is. And it has a whole bunch of examples of stuff that we're building. And then some of the pro ones I went ahead and put in, where it says my favorite e-learning. You can find some of those down there. So you can see what, what are the pros, what's the pros build that you can also build and captivate. It's inspirational. 
And there are other products out there that do some of the similar things. They may not have as many features or it may not be as easily accessible or able to create these things. Um, but these are great ideas that you can take and adapt for whatever you teach. And um, if you don't have access to a similar product, then I think the monthly subscription is really a great way to go. And that's exciting that you can collaborate as well with the monthly subscriptions. Okay, and then let's see, Desiree had asked about any particular people that I follow on Adobe Exchange. I think you can actually see each other's, what, who, who they're following. Usually though what I do is I just go in and I just search by tool. So if I'm looking for, let's see what people are doing in Adobe Captivate uh, since the last time I checked. I'll just have it, have it filtered by Adobe Captivate. And, um, and it's really easy. They've got forums in there. If you've got a question, you can go into the forums, ask other instructors. And it covers a lot more than Captivate. You can learn about all kinds of different things. So there's teachers in there that are teaching the subject that you're teaching. You can go in and ask about a subject question. It's not just for the, the Adobe software. They've made it as a site for teachers to share about things that teachers are interested in and made it really easy to share the Adobe products. A lot of the teachers that are there are teachers that actually teach these Adobe products in their school districts. If your school district has Adobe products such as Photoshop, um, Flash, Dreamweaver, um, then you might want to let your teachers know that that's there for them. They have, they have whole curriculums you can download for Photoshop and Dreamweaver and so they, they'll probably find, oh wow, I don't, have to make, I don't have to make so much stuff. There's a lot of stuff here that other, uh, other instructors have built, even whole curriculums that other instructors have built and they make the whole curriculum available. Uh, let's see, when you play yeah, and the QR codes there, the QR codes are also in that link that I gave, that master link. Um, that Q, the QR codes are there for you there too. So if you, if you like to be able to have it up on your desktop and run it in your desktop version and then point your QR code reader on your mobile to the QR code, you can run both side by side. <laughs> hey, I understand. I teach 40 hours per week in class time, six different subjects from fifth grade all the way up to high school level sciences. And I tell you, it's one of those things, it's hard to get everything in there that you want to get. But this is something I love. I, for me, I'm very drawn to the, well, for those of you that remember me from the Learn Central days, you'll know that I was, I was the big proponent of let's, let's do stuff on the slides in the online classroom where you can pick stuff up, move stuff around, and let the, let the kids interact with it. So it's just a core of my teaching style. Yeah, now the one nice thing about, about teaching with an LMS is that you don't have to rebuild everything from year to year. You can keep using it, so that helps. <laughs> there you go. All right, now did I miss any questions? If you did, feel free to let me know. Just raise your hand, you can get on the mic, or type your question in again if I missed it. Yeah, I love teaching with an LMS. And Moodle is free software. You do still have to make sure you've got a server, but a lot of school districts, if you've got an IT department and some servers, they'll put Moodle on for you. I know my son, he's in IT department. They had a teacher ask for Moodle and they put, they put it on there. And it's really nice because you can set your, you can make your quizzes and everything and captivate and then you don't have to do any more grading. I, I do, the only grading I have to do is lab reports. And that's it. And, and that's, that's easy. All the other stuff, all of the lecture quizzes, all my exams, everything, I've all got computer, computer uh, done. Now, three years ago, before I started doing that, it was two hours every night because I had about 140 students. So this has made my job so much easier. It was worth the time that it took to, to build stuff. Now, in this instance, it was the Moodle quizzes before I started using this, but with SCORM, you can do the same. Uh -huh, yeah, and it does. That's, they're leaving behind the box copies. They're, Adobe is not going to do box copies anymore. I think maybe Captivate might do one more because they made the decision after Captivate was, or the team was already kind of aiming for their next box copy. But after that, I think it's all going to go subscription all through the, all, everything Adobe makes. 
And um, if you subscribe, it's much better than buying the box copy. One, it's a lot cheaper to get into it. And two, you always have the most up-to-date thing. They, they're switching over to just releasing a feature at a time or a couple features at a time. As soon as those features are released, you automatically get it. You get the new feature. For instance, uh, Adobe 6 came out, and then they added the drag and drop, I think, at 6.1. And as a subscriber, I automatically got the drag and drop. No, you don't. You don't lose that. Well, you lose. You lose access to Captivate whenever you unsubscribe, but you don't lose access to what you build. So if you, so if you, let's say you build a lesson, and then you cancel your subscription, your lessons are yours. Yeah, the only thing that the only thing you have to be careful about is the trial version. That's a little different. In the trial version, you get to try it out, but you don't get to use your stuff that you build during the trial version. But by just one subscription, you know, by a month subscription, you just republish the, each of the things you built. So keep up with them as far as where you're publishing to so you can find them and remember which ones you had. Then you just republish them, and then from there on out, they'll always be there for you, even if you cancel your subscription. Oh, yeah, it is tricky to find. Let me go ahead and get that link for you. Hold on. Actually, what it is is whenever you click to buy, it's one of the options in click to buy. Hold on a second. Let me get you the link for subscription. Here's, this, here's the subscription link. I meant to share that earlier, and I forgot. All right, here you go. There's the subscription link right there, and it explains all of the different options that you have. For those of you that are, shi are signing in from the Eastern Hemisphere, you'll be pleased to know that the team is actually in the Eastern Hemisphere. Notice the UK. You're actually buying your product from the UK, so for the so you you've got it right close by. Mm -hmm. um, are there any last questions before we let Tammy go? If so, you can always contact Tammy more at the uh, at her home school and co-op. And she was with us each and every Saturday. And that's more information about her website and URL and email address. So uh, just let, it, let her know if you have questions that come up after the show that you think about. And be sure to fill out the survey and to submit some nominations for the Live Binders contest that is coming up. And join us for our featured teacher next session next Saturday um, at the same time right here in the same room. So have a great weekend. Again, thank you so much, Tammy. This is definitely one I'll be watching again so I can uh, take some more detailed notes and follow the step-by-step -step directions. So take care, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next Saturday. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.